Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Stephanie Green. I am an assistant professor and Canada Research Chair in the Department of Biological Sciences at the University of Alberta. I'm a marine ecologist by training and I'm passionate about understanding and conserving our oceans. And today I want to talk about some specific research that we're doing here at the University of Alberta internationally that relates to our society and the sea, especially actions and challenges that we're researching for sustaining what I call our planetary life support system. The SDG that our research relates to is life below water, which is this overarching challenge to conserve and sustainably use the ocean, seas, and marine resources for sustainable development. That's no small feat, and there's a number of specific goals and outcomes associated with achieving SDG 14. But why should we here in Alberta and really globally care about what's happening with life below water? What I want to do today is first tell you a little bit about why the ocean is so important and then take you into coral reef systems to talk specifically about what the challenges are facing sustaining ocean systems and some of the research that we're doing. So why should you care about the ocean? Well, astronauts that go into space often report being just astounded by the appearance of Earth uh, when you step back for millions of miles. And in particular, many writers, authors, astronauts, and others have observed how inappropriate to call this planet Earth when it is quite clearly ocean. And that's because if you take this satellite image of the Earth and you allow Earth to undergo its natural rotation, you'll pretty soon hit a point where you're looking at the planet and it is almost entirely covered with blue. Blue being the color that's emitted by our oceans that's visible to the naked eye. In fact, over 70% of our planet's surface is covered by seawater and our oceans contain more than half of our globe's biodiversity. Oceans are incredibly important for a number of things that we rely on globally and especially right here in Alberta. In particular, our oceans provide a huge amount of oxygen production for our planet. More than one out of every two breaths that you're taking comes from ocean sources. Microscopic and large organisms in the ocean produce almost 70% of our oxygen budget for the planet. Here, what I'm showing you is a satellite image of coastal oceans off the coast of Canada. And these bright turquoise streaks of green that you can see are microscopic organisms called phytoplankton. And just these microscopic plankton themselves produce nearly 50% of our oxygen supply, an incredibly astounding amount. This watery blue content on our planet also ho holds most of the carbon dioxide, which is the major greenhouse gas that's contributing to the changing temperatures and climate regimes on our planet. Here I'm showing you in the blue circles, different sources of where carbon is sequestered across the globe. Many of us often think about plants such as forests or grasslands here in Alberta when we think about the important um, places that carbon is locked away. And certainly plants are important, but if we think about the magnitude of carbon storage just in plants or in other soil resources, it's just a small fraction of the carbon that has the potential to be stored in our oceans, which is the largest blue circle here. The ocean's capacity to absorb carbon and also regulate uh, heating is incredibly important for our global climate and temperatures. In particular, ocean currents take heat that is absorbed by the oceans at the um, equator and transfers it to the poles, keeping and regulating our climate across latitudes. And so, for example, distributing this heat from the equator back to the poles is what gives us moderate temperatures at mid latitudes, like here in Alberta, that allow us to have warm growing conditions with enough moisture to, to support crops and also happy people in the summertime. Our oceans are incredibly important also for global food supply. Global fisheries are valued at over $240 billion annually. Um, fish and other uh, marine organisms are harvested from oceans around the world and brought to markets like we have just here in Edmonton. Over three and a half billion people in the world rely on marine animals for their food, and many more rely on those marine animals to provide a source of income by selling those seafoods around the world. 
Something I find really interesting is the extent to which medicines are starting to come from the ocean. Many marine invertebrates from sponges to jellyfish to cone snails are producing important chemicals that have properties that are incredibly therapeutic for humans, for everything from fighting cancer to easing pain to helping to treat arthritis and also um, a number of other diseases that emerge within our population. Some local connections to the sea. It might be interesting to many of you to know that Alberta was a part of a shallow tropical sea for many millions of years. This is a map of Western North America in the late Devonian about 380 million years ago. And Alberta is circled in the box at the top. The light blue turquoise color there shows that Alberta, most of it was covered by a shallow sea. And at this point, our landmass was near uh, the equator with a tropical climate. And that means that within our Rocky Mountains, we have amazing fossil records of coral reef ecosystems, which is pictured here in the central top, shallow coastal seas where much of the life that we know today began. In particular, we call the Devonian the age of fishes. This is when fishes began to emerge in our evolutionary history, which then gave rise to four legged animals, which eventually gave rise to people. And so if you're hiking in the Rocky Mountains, you can often find evidence of the strong local connection to coral reef ecosystems back from many millions of years. Of course, coral reef ecosystems thrive today, and they're an ecosystem that my lab at the University of Alberta works on intensely. Corals are what we call a biogenic habitat, meaning that they're made up of millions of millions of tiny living animals that form the basis or the structure of the ecosystem. This is a close-up view of a coral polyp, which is actually an animal that is closely related to a jellyfish. And inside this coral animal, the green dots are photosynthetic algae that live in symbiosis with the coral animal and allow it to survive in clear, low nutrient waters uh, across latitudes. This is the global distribution of coral reefs. You can see that we find tropical reefs in low latitudes near the equator, which is in red, but increasingly scientists are discovering that coral reefs proliferate across the globe. In deep cold waters, we also find animals that are corals that are supporting whole ecosystems of organisms that have yet to be discovered. One of the challenges that oceans face is the decline of the key species that form habitats there. And corals are a wonderful example of this and a very sad example. These are data showing changes in the abundance of corals on coral reefs in the Caribbean basin over a period of just a few decades. In particular, coral cover or the amount of live coral on reefs in this region declined from around 60 or 70% down to just a few percent over just a few decades, essentially within less than my lifetime. A picture is worth a thousand words, and so I can show you these data of coral declines, but I can also just show you what has happened in some of the key spots where our research group works. This is Cary's Fort Reef. It was one of the first coral reefs to be uh, put in color in National Geographic magazine back in the 1960s. And on the left, you can see stands of um, wonderful uh, Alcorn corals, Acropora palmata, back in the 1970s that nearly brushed the surface of the ocean. They had grown so tall. And on the right is that exact same spot several decades later where we've lost all of that habitat forming coral and we see almost no corals left. Let's cause these major declines, these ob observable declines in coral reef ecosystems. Well, what's caused these changes is a number of factors, both global and local, including climate stress, changing temperatures, acidity, pH across the world, um, disease, pollution and contamination from coastal developments, and also over harvesting of key marine life, such as herbivores that play important functional roles in maintaining coral health. Through conservation actions, uh, in many places of the world, we're starting to get a handle on these local stressors, i.e. those that are in control of the populations that live near the coastline, such as putting in sewage treatment, limiting the amount of nutrients that put into the coastal ocean, and by regulating our fishing practices. However, what we are not yet able to do is mitigate all of the manifesting impacts of climate on our ocean systems 
that requires global efforts to reduce greenhouse gases, and that's something that we really just need to work much more on. So I want to talk about how coral reefs are interacting with these stressors and what really we can do to try and restore and protect and sustain both the people and the animals that rely on these ocean habitats. In particular, one of the SDG targets that our research group focuses on is the aim of, by 2020, sustainably managing and protecting marine and coastal ecosystems to avoid significant adverse impacts, including by strengthening their resilience and taking action for their restoration to achieve healthy and productive oceans. That is an absolute mouthful. So I wanna highlight just a couple of key phrases that we really think about when we're doing our research and we think about what kind of actions people can take in order to help protect and restore the ocean. Really, it's this text here highlighted in yellow that gives us our actions. Sustainably manage and protect and take action for restoration. This essentially means we need to understand and protect what we have left and we need to take steps to put back what we have lost. And I wanna talk about two projects that focus specifically on understanding and trying to protect what we have, and also importantly, taking actions to put back what we have lost, especially in coral reef ecosystems. One of the main avenues for putting back what we have lost with coral reefs as they've declined is this idea of coral restoration. This is where we actively transplant live corals back out onto the reefs where they've been lost. Essentially, it's like reforestation underwater. And we're doing this in particular with corals that are more resistant to heat stress and other types of effects that occur as a result of climate change. So essentially, we can grow back coral reefs, but grow them back better with corals that are more likely to survive ongoing climate change in the ocean. Now, this is incredibly labor intensive work. We have literally millions and millions of acres of coral reef that have been lost, but local efforts are showing us that by actually putting back corals, planting them back onto reefs, we can start to have the effect of recovering the ecosystem. It's where to put these corals and what the impacts of this restoration are that our lab researches. In particular, we go underwater and we employ scientific techniques such as surveys and transects to study the organisms that live on coral reefs that are undergoing restoration. We also bring organisms into the lab and we study how uh, those organisms that depend on coral reefs for their habitat interact with one another and also interact with the corals themselves. So I wanna walk you just briefly through some of the important interactions that we study and that we're hoping to protect and restore in coral reef systems. This is what we call an interaction web. It gives you an idea of the main players in coral reef systems and how they influence one another. In particular, in a healthy coral reef system, we have the corals providing the structural framework, essentially the houses and homes for many organisms that live on the reef. We call this habitat complexity. And habitat complexity is very important for providing shelter space, reproductive space, and also feeding opportunities for species like fishes on coral reefs. Species like fish that live on coral reefs also have an important role to play. In particular, their role becomes evident when we introduce another player, macroalgae. Macroalgae are a group of species that compete with corals for space on the bottom on coral reefs, and their comp competitive interactions can leave us either in a coral-dominated or an algae-dominated space. But these fishes help to protect the corals by grazing or eating the macroalgae, keeping them under check and allowing the coral to thrive. What's happened as we've had mounting stress to coral reef ecosystems from climate change, pollution, species loss, and habitat loss is we've jeopardized the integrity of the populations of corals that form the basis of these systems. And essentially what we've done is we've caused them to decline over time. As those corals have declined, what we've seen is that the habitat complexity of the system has been eroded, we've lost the fish, and we've allowed macroalgae to win this competition, these battles with coral. We've shifted to an algae-dominated state. What we're hoping to do with restoration is bolster populations of corals 
and allow them to play that key role in providing habitat complexity that fish will be attracted to and allowing then fish to do their job of helping to uh, reduce the macroalgae and reduce that competition with the corals. What we're really interested in in our research is understanding how much live coral must be replanted for fishes to recover. And in our lab in particular, what we're doing is we're utilizing artificial corals and live corals in outplanting or essentially coral reforestation experiments to understand how much coral needs to be put back onto a reef to try and elicit these feedback effects that recover the system. Doing this work and in particular incorporating artificial corals has meant developing some new techniques that I'm happy to see have developed here at the University of Alberta. In particular, my graduate student in Neri Garg has been designing replicate corals to help us understand restoration. She's essentially been taking 3D scans of real corals and printing them using 3D printer technology to create replicates that look the same but are not made of the same material. This is happening in collaboration with folks in engineering, paleontology, and physical and visual arts here at the University of Alberta. And she's created a new technique called 3D SPMC, which involves scanning, printing, and then molding and casting replicate corals that could be put back out onto a reef to understand how the proportion of actual coral to structurally similar, similar corals influences restoration. We're also trying to understand how the framework of corals that's left behind once corals die, or that habitat complexity, influences the return of fishes when we put live corals back out onto the reef. And so my graduate student, Noelle Helder, has been building 3D models of coral reefs using structure from motion photogrammetry. Essentially, this means going out onto the reef and taking hundreds, if not thousands, of pictures of the coral on the bottom or the reef on the bottom and stitching them together using special software to essentially create a 3D computer model of the reef that you can manipulate and look at the various structural aspects of. Putting these two methods together of replicating live corals and creating these 3D models of coral reefs, we're able to go out into areas that are being restored and do experiments underwater. Replanting corals in different different proportions of live to artificial coral and targeting our restoration efforts in different areas, in areas in particular of high complexity and low background complexity to see how fishes respond. After we've done these experiments, this is what we find. In areas where we have already high complexity, where lots of that reef framework is left, we see a lesser response of fish to adding live coral cover back. In particular, we don't see much difference between a control area where we haven't put any coral back and areas where we've added 100% living coral back to the reef. But in areas that have already been flattened by erosion and other processes, these low complexity reefs, we see a strong response of fishes to putting back live coral cover in particular, a significant difference between control areas where we've done no restoration and areas where we put an increasing proportion of live coral in terms of the fishes that come back to those sites. So what we see is evidence that it matters where you put coral restoration efforts, in particular, how much coral you put out and what the background structure of the reefs look like. One additional area that I wanna finish off by talking about this morning that's really related to these restoration efforts and must happen in a complementary way is thinking about what kinds of fishes can exist on these reefs and why it matters what types of fishes are there. In particular, our lab is really interested in thinking about invasive fishes, fishes that don't belong in coral reef ecosystems and might be disrupting these important feedbacks that we see between coral habitat and fish roles in maintaining the ecosystem. Invasive species are species that have been introduced by people, either intentionally or unintentionally, and are causing impacts, negative impacts, either to the ecosystem, the economy, or society. Globally, we have over 200 marine and estuarine invasive species across the world. And the one that we focus on the most is the invasive Indo-Pacific lionfish, which has colonized coral reefs in the Caribbean basin from the Indian Pacific Oceans. You might recognize lionfish as a beautiful aquarium fish that is uh, sold around the world in pet stores and also a feature in many public aquariums. 
they are brought into North America and particularly the United States. This is a map of, of Florida in the tens of thousands each year. And what we think is most likely is that lionfish kept in aquaria by people in areas uh, where the habitat was suitable for lionfish let their pets go into coastal waterways instead of dealing with them appropriately. Those fish survived, began reproducing, and have caused a massive invasion of coral reef habitats in this part of the world. The red dots here are lionfish sightings uh, over that have accumulated over about a 10 to 15 year period just in this region of the world. What we find is that lionfish are incredibly good at outcompeting native coral reef fish that play important ecological roles. They're an order of magnitude more abundant on reefs than the native species that we'd like to find there. And in particular, they have a venomous sting that makes them incredibly hard to handle and makes it unlikely that other species are going to control them by consuming them. The biggest problem with lionfish is their broad diet. They're what we call a gape-limited predator that eats many different species of prey. And when we collect data on the changes in these important reef fishes, uh, what we see is that as lionfish have established, they can reduce these reef fishes by up to 95% in just a few short years. Of course, we've discussed that corals have declined and now we have invasive lionfish as well. And countries around the region have tried to take management interventions to try and target and remove lionfish, both by catching them with nets catching them with spears and other devices. They've literally removed wheelbarrowfuls of lionfish to try and reduce their populations on reefs. These efforts have been happening across a broad number of countries. Over 22 countries are dealing with this particular invasive species. And when we get managers and scientists together to share lessons with one another, one thing becomes incredibly clear. We are very unlikely to completely get rid of lionfish given their broad range and the habitats they occupy, which is this area in red here, based just on thermal tolerance. Instead, what we're likely to do is intervene to remove lionfish from just a subset of priority locations where we have reef areas that we really want to protect and restore that are of high value to coastal people. So which area should we prioritize for these intensive activities and intervention to restore the system? Well, the way that we've uh, approached this question with our research is by thinking about which areas have species that are the most vulnerable. In particular, lionfish don't eat everything equally. There's a number of different traits of these many hundreds of species in coral reef ecosystems that they prefer to munch on. That is influenced by the shape and size of the prey, where they are in the water column, how they behave, when they're active, and whether or not they have any defenses to ward off predators. When we put together all of these characteristics, we can actually create a map of the hotspots of species on coral reefs that are likely to be impacted by lionfish. We can target these for our restoration and intervention efforts. In particular, the areas in yellow and red are places with species of fish that are most likely to be impacted by lionfish. If we zoom in just on the red square on the left side of the map, we can look at coastal Belize. In particular, we could think about a species that's found there and nowhere else on earth that's very likely to be impacted by lionfish invading coral reefs there. The social wrasse, these beautiful little colorful fish that you see on the left. Research that we've been doing in Belize is trying to think about how we can create socially sustainable ways to control lionfish that promote the recovery of reef fishes and sustain coral reef ecosystems. In particular, we assess the system to see how many lionfish need to be removed to try and retain species like the social wrasse that play important roles on the coral reefs there. And then we think about ways that we might be able to harvest lionfish and who could be involved. In particular, fishers in Costa Belize often harvest fish from a number of different families and are really interested in targeting lionfish too to try and put them on their dinner plates. But of course, fishers have to be able to sell their products to a market. And so this relies on restaurants and other social markets being willing to accept lionfish culturally and also find customers for them. And that requires that people know about lionfish and the fact that they're safe to eat. And really interestingly, on top of this, it can also mean finding value added ways to increase the price that fishers get for the lionfish that they catch. 
And a burgeoning industry in Belize in particular is creating jewelry out of the fins of lionfish that get a better price for the fish that the fishers catch and make it more sustainable for them to harvest. You might consider looking for lionfish jewelry next time you need to buy a gift for someone. And so what we've been doing through this work is coupling the need to recover and restore important coral reef fishes that help to maintain and play those important feedback roles in maintaining coral health with socially sustainable ways to restore and manage the ecosystem, such as harvesting fish like lionfish for jewelry and for food. So in summary, if we go back to this SDG goal of managing and restoring the ecosystem to achieve healthy, productive oceans, our research is illustrating two key ways that this can happen, particularly for sensitive coral reefs that are found across our globe. And in particular, those ways are targeting restoration in areas that maximize fish recovery and controlling invasive species at the same time to prevent fish declines. And all of these healthy coral reef ecosystem functions need people. They need people to step up, to intervene, and to take action in a way that's guided by science to both support their ecosystems and livelihoods that depend on them. Thank you very much for listening to me this afternoon. I'd be happy to take any questions by email, and I look forward to engaging with you and watching more of the wonderful presentations that are going on during International Week.